Greetings, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the uh, eAssessment Scotland slash Transform the Assessment online conference. This session on the 8th of September is on BYOD on campus e exams at the University of Tasmania. And our speaker today is Dr. Andrew Flock from UTAS. So, Andrew, would you like to take it away, please? Thank you very much, Matthew, for introducing me. I really appreciate the time that everybody's uh, put into attending this. So, um, I'm very interested to have dialogues with this. So, I don't want to speak more than that. 35 minutes at most if I can, and uh, as Matthew said, if you want to ask a question, please feel free to do so at any stage. Um, so for those that may not have been aware of what we've been doing in Tasmania, um, I'm just going to give you a, a bit of a summary of what the talk will contain. Um, first of all, we've got seven sections here with the rationale and the technical implementation, and then I want to move into the realistic um, concept of what's actually going on in the exam hall and show how we've been connecting with our pre-tertiary sector. Um, there are some technical challenges which I think this technique and several others face and also the issue of innovation resistance from institutions and uh, I'd like to talk briefly then again about ways forward. Um, just before I go any further, um, I do want to make it quite clear that um, my faculty and our institution don't regard exams as the definite requirement for all assessment in uh, the, the higher education sector. Um, I would like to make sure that people are aware that we use exams as a part of a strategic mix of assessments. So we have coursework assessments and in some cases we have um, exam assessments. In our particular faculty, um, when we actually add up all the marks which go into a Bachelor of Education degree, less than 20% of the marks are definitively attributable to the individual. And much of that comes from their professional experience in schools. So you can see that for us, for our faculty, exams are actually quite a small part of the assessment. In other faculties, for instance, law, it's a much greater proportion because it's really important that they only give the law degree to the person that's done the work. So um, as long as we're quite clear that this is not a push to say everybody should do exams unless you do it this way, um, I'd be very grateful if you could take that understanding on board. Okay, so the first section, uh, Matthew's written about this, but I think it needs to be reiterated just briefly, the rationale for e-exams. First of all, um, our feeling is that if you're going to do an e-assessment, you need a full operating system for every candidate. Um, and that perhaps is in contrast to some ways of doing e-exams which are restricted to a web browser or perhaps to an armored word processor. Um, I think if you restrict yourself to either of those two situations, um, you're not actually going to be able to unpack all of the things that you can do in an assessment situation um, using a computer. So that's the first um, requirement. The second one is that at the moment, um, if you're using wireless, for example, to connect in uh, laptops, if you want to show a bit of high definition video and you want to distribute that to say 500 or 300 candidates, um, the current uh, data rates don't permit that if they all choose to view the video at the same time, but in overlapping time. So it's rather than the broadcast, it's uh, people picking up that video at different times. So uh, wireless infrastructure provides a single point of failure, which if you've got 300 candidates' lives on the line is really not a good idea. And at the moment, the high data rates for rich media can't be supported. So what we've done is therefore move towards a system whereby we've used the USB boot system uh, and every student boots their computer from that USB. So let's have a look at the technical implementation. And this is written up in some of the journals, so it will be quite rushed because I want to be able to get to some of the thornier problems um, towards the end. So this is a description of the kind of USB that we're providing. Um, we provide a modified version of Ubuntu, which students start their own laptop up from. It's free and open source, and so therefore there's no cost involved in licensing this, uh, this particular software. Uh, a separate partition holds the questions and any other digital materials which the students are going to be asked to refer to. And we then have a third, at least a third area where they put their answers, 
and in the current version of the e-exam system that uh, Matthew is working on, there's even a fourth version for a database um, associated with a copy of Moodle. So we're beginning to, to spread beyond our original conception. Um, the nice thing about using a USB stick to boot each student's personal laptop is that we don't have a single point of failure that's going to affect every single candidate. If there is a failure, it's restricted to that particular individual and it won't affect anybody else at all. We have some security built in and uh, I'm only mentioning this top level security um, because there are other levels as well. So generally speaking, we can choose this, but um, when I run an e-exam, I have all communications locked off. Uh, in our original version of the e-exam system, we actually took out the IP stack. Um, we made sure that Bluetooth and other kinds of communications were not possible. The, the second communications, sorry, the second security um, feature is that there's no access to local hard disk drives or USBs. Um, we want to make sure that this is the work of the student and only that particular student. And finally, for exam invigilators or supervisors who have no computer technical experience and they're not employed, generally speaking, on, on that basis, we provide a security image. And typically what I do is I ask the lecturers here to send us a photograph which has never been seen by anybody before of perhaps their favorite pet or a, a picture of a garden or a park or something like that. And we issue that to the exam supervisors as a postcard. Um, when students boot up from the e-exam USB, which you can see on this slide, that picture comes up on the desktop. And it's a very easy matter for the supervisor to look at the postcard and run his or her eyes over all the desktops from the back of the hall, of course. Um, and if there's a single machine with a, a different dog or a pony instead, um, they know very well that that student has not actually booted up from the USB stick which was provided to them on the exam desk. So it's a very simple, very effective way of making sure that everybody's starting the right exam. Um, what we've done is actually found that students need to have compatible equipment. And to ensure that that happens, we asked them to go through a self-certification process um, up to a month before the exam. Um, this is sometimes a little bit tricky for some students. So I'm, I'm lucky that I'm teaching a, um, an ICT, a digital technologies unit, so this can be quite easily integrated into the, the unit. But for other students, the idea of installing a piece of software on their computer, and notice this particular routine, um, installing the software is only for PCs. And, and if they've got a Mac, they need to find a PC to just do this first step. Um, they have to download a very large file, and we have found that that's caused some problems. In, for instance, um, one of our students was in one of the Arab states and uh, found that downloading it from our university web server was difficult, but when we provided that file through Dropbox, um, it came down very easily indeed. So they then have to write the image to the blank USB stick, um, and that gives them a practice stick in order to self-certify their computer. So they can now go to their Macintosh if they wish, they can put that USB into the Macintosh, turn it on, hold the Alt option button down during the boot up process and select the EFI boot process if that's appropriate for them. Um, and they can run through a practice exam. So this is not a, a, an exam that's a previous paper, paper for the subject, it's a generic exam. So this self-certification process is quite usable for whatever exam is going to come up um, in the actual subject that they're going to be examined in. So that self-certification process is highlighted in red on this screenshot from our university website. And you'll see that it's got a link there that goes to a self-certification process. Um, and it takes them through that idea of making up their own USB stick. Um, I have to point out that some of them get a bit surprised that after the creation of the USB stick, they find it smaller than it was before because, of course, we've written three or four partitions to it. 
Um, and generally speaking, on a Windows machine, you can only see the first partition. So um, I have yet to go through a process of how to clean your personal USB off so it can be returned back to service afterwards. I just say that that's a, that's a present for you. You can enjoy that um, after your studies are finished. The, um, the next step is just to show you how that USB stick is actually put into action. So what I do is I explain to people that the normal process for starting up a laptop is you tap the power button and you just sit back and wait and the operating system installed on your internal hard drive boots up. And in this case, it's a very old copy of Windows XP. The slight modification to that process that we need to train students to undertake is to go through a three-stage process. So this is shown at the bottom of the slide. They insert the USB, the e-exam USB stick, and they tap the power button as before. But then they have to quickly move their finger to the one-time boot key for their particular make and model of laptop. We provide a, a small list of typical make and model one-time boot keys. Um, and that gets the majority of students through this process. They then have to choose the USB as the source of the operating system for the, the coming session. And um, after a little while, they'll get a picture like the one on the right-hand side. Um, I have to say, in fact, that we've now modified the software. And what they will actually see in the center of the security image, because that's what we've got here, is a security image there they'll see a little box that says, what's your uh, student ID number? And once they've provided the student ID number, the computer will automatically find the question paper, modify the file name of the question paper, and save it into the answers partition, open it up on the screen, and the student is ready to read questions and do whatever is necessary to create the answers to them. Um, OK, so that's the, the simple process. Well, you would like to think that it's simple. Uh, we have noticed over time that manufacturers are wanting to close their ecosystems more and more. Um, obviously, this process will not work on an iPad, because there's no facility to plug in a USB stick. Um, and we're finding that with Windows 8 particularly, there are quite a lot of steps that have to be gone through in order to disable secure boot and so on. Um, the students I work with uh, quite like it when I show them how to modify their BIOS so that a USB stick is at the top of the boot order. That means all they have to do is to go into the exam room, plug in the power to their laptop, stick in the USB, and just turn it on and stand back. Because the USB is then at the top of the BIOS boot order, that simplifies things very quickly. I see we've got laptop malfunctions during the exam. We'll come to that. <laughs> Don't worry, that's a big item in today's talk. Um, but I just want to make sure that the context is established so the processes are understood. OK, so <clears throat> here is the system process. You start off with an exam paper that's been created by an assessor. That's converted into a digital format, typically um, a Word document and put onto a single USB stick, along with the other components I've mentioned. That USB stick is used as a master. Uh, I personally use one of these commercial devices for duplicating it. They can be stacked two or three high, so we can do batches of 20, 40, or 60 USB sticks in any one go. And it takes about five to 10 minutes to copy the entire USB master stick onto the duplicates. Each candidate's desk in the exam hall is then provided with a single sheet of instructions of how to do this. They've used it before in the practice in the self-certification process and a USB stick. So one USB stick, which contains the questions and will shortly contain the answers to those questions. The responses, I should say, because um, the answers may not be written. We then take those USB sticks after the exam and put them into the same device. It's able to read off, suck out, if you like, all the answer scripts. And our common practice is to put those onto 
two CDs, one which is retained by our exams office and one which is then passed on to the assessors. We don't prescribe any particular method for assessing, whether on screen or, or on paper. And I do know that when our law faculty have used this system, the um, lecturer has handed the CD like a hot potato to his admin staff and said, could you please print this lot out? Um, and that's fair enough. They do say that even though they're going back to marking on paper, it's so much easier to read what's been created by the student. Um, typically in a pen and paper exam, you'll find a sentence with a, a, an asterisk halfway through and say, see note three, and then note three is on some other page somewhere else, which is really difficult, at least because if they're using a word processor, it's, it's quite easy. So that's the, the generic process. And here is an example of the outcome. There's the original paper, and there's a digital copy appearing on, uh, and in this case, just a netbook. Um, we, we can get this running on quite low specification machines. So generally speaking, there's not much of a, an impost on students, um, although that does vary um, around the state. When we've got this new medium, um, the sorts of things I've been doing over the years is moving from a paper replacement to a post-paper exam scenario. Um, this particular one points to a PowerPoint, which I ask students to um, do a critical appreciation of from a teacher's point of view, which included animations and which included sound effects. And that's immediately something which you cannot do very easily on, on paper. But we also provide PDF documents. In fact, I had an inquiry from one of our lecturers in the business faculty who wanted to put uh, I think 2,000 pages of tax office rulings into a PDF document to, to put or make them available to the candidates during the exam. Um, this particular element is a video. So we've, we gave students a video describing a piece of software, and they were able to then answer questions about um, the capacity of that software to Im improve learning. And finally, we can actually run some limited software we found that if we've got a portable app version of a piece of Windows software, generally speaking, that will run using the Wine emulator very well indeed, because we are in a Linux kind of environment, um, and so we can't necessarily guarantee to run all Windows software. But we do have to be careful about the software licensing arrangements as well. So this is all open source, um, and we've got to choose carefully what we put onto the exam. When it comes to making diagrams, there are, in LibreOffice, there are some standard word processor type um, diagram tools, but we also ask them to learn to use the GIMP. And you can see uh, some of the kinds of diagrams that students have come up with um, in one of our exams a couple of years ago. Um, I like the one down the bottom of the center underneath a flower. Nearly done. I can imagine that's a sort of an emotional response from a lot of students. Okay, so. What I'm going to do now is move you to what's actually happening in our exam halls. And um, I think this is where we can see quite clearly that we've moved past the initiation phase and we're actually using this process at the University of Tasmania for students to get up to 50% of their final marks for a particular unit of study. So what I'm doing is I'm just showing you a couple of stills for the time being. Uh, which are going to be referred to in a little video I'm going to paste into the chat area in just a second. So if you have the opportunity to open a second browser or, or perhaps have open another tab in a little while, you'll be able to see a two and a th three quarter minute video. You'll see in this particular slide that there's a candidate who's very close to us who's using a pen. And just in the second row behind her, this is a young gentleman wearing glasses who's using a computer. And I would like you to compare those two in the short video, which will shortly be given access to. Um, this next picture shows you a, a lot of e-exam students. And if you notice in the foreground, one of the students is actually using a piece of software. It's a little bit like a simulation of Google Earth. Uh, it's a portable app version of that kind of software. 
um, and you'll see the student is, is reading through some instructions and getting ready to have a go with that particular bit of software. Um, also in this room, there are other students who are not using computers. So I'm going to bring that theme out for you in just a little while. And finally, there are health and safety issues. We make a commitment to provide a main PowerPoint to all of our candidates because we're not yet satisfied that laptops can have enough battery to last um, a two or three hour exam. So we actually prepare the exam room by dividing the aisles up into those which are for um, movement and those which are purely for the electrical power cords. So those are the three um, things that I'd like you to notice. When we get to the video, so I'm now just copying the video URL into the chat area. And what I'm going to do is just go quiet for three minutes so that you've got time to have a quick look at that video and then we'll come back. Okay, I'm back now. Um, does anybody like to ask a question about the video? If you'd like to just raise your hand. Uh, Andrew, people have put some questions into the text chat if you want to scroll up a bit. Yeah, okay. Um, I'll see some of these uh, questions here. So um, I agree with Tim um, in terms of, I'll get to you in a second, Rebecca. Uh, in terms of what Tim says, yes, it looks as though the screens are very easy to, to see, but Reading it sideways is really hard, and of course the person whose screen would be easiest to read is the person in front of you, but unfortunately their body's in the way, so um, that actually causes that to, to be not a problem so much. Um, I'll take the question here about clickety-clack of nearby typists. Bear in mind my phone, which was used to take those videos, increases the gain until it gets the nearest sound. In actual fact, we've done some tests on this, and the rustling of papers is actually louder than the soft laptop keys. Um, Charmaine's asked a question about the speed of typing, and we always respond by saying we've never compared handwriting speeds in an exam situation. Why do you bring that up now? The other thing is um, we did some tests and we found out that students who are using the computer produced about 20% more words, but they didn't score uh, significantly greater marks. So we're at the moment not able to say that the 
handwriters or the um, typists have an advantage. Um, so no, there's no complaints about noises. Uh, we'll talk about the equity and access issues in just a second. Um, and there's some other comments there. Um, Rebecca, would you like to? Oh, you're, you're, you've typed your message in here. Yeah. They felt handwriting helped them write more well thought through answers. And uh, Nora Moge and I have done a, a post exam survey, which has been published in BJET, which looks at those sorts of things. And Tim brings up her um, name there. That's good. Uh, Alexander. I'm not sure if I've seen your question. Did you want to talk? Oh, I think your question was about the power aisle in emergency situations. Um, the power aisle, as you can see from the videos, is only one or two aisles at the moment. Um, because it's every second aisle, there's still plenty of room for every candidate to be approached by a supervisor or to run along a communications aisle. So every candidate has a communications, a movement aisle um, next to the desk on one side or the other. So it's not come up as an issue just yet. yet. Okay, I'll continue. Uh, Ken's got his hand up. Ken, do you want to ask a question via a microphone? If you do, press the talk button and you should be able to transmit sound. Okay, it looks like not. Um, if you have, I'm going to put the hands, um, you might need to turn off the hand symbols. So if you can just drop your hands down so we know that you're done, that would be great. Okay, I'm moving on. So, um, yes, we've had a, um, some interesting things happen this year. Um, for the most recent uh, e-exam that I conducted, I had 156 candidates. Um, we had four venues in Tasmania with 68 in one particular venue. Um, we had another 34 scattered across Australia and one overseas in Qatar that I mentioned earlier. Um, we have a system which I'm sure most other universities use of allowing students to nominate a local supervisor um, who is taken to be a trusted person and to whom the USB is sent. Uh, he or she supervises the student as they go and um, send the USB with the answer scripts on it back to us for data collection and marking. Um, we did have a bit of a problem because at the biggest venue in Tasmania, our exams office, and they've never done this before um, in the long period of time that we've been doing this, over seven years now, actually issued too few USBs. Now, this did cause a lot of problems in terms of this was a post paper exam. After the first three years, I moved past paper and started setting the multimedia kinds of exams that I've illustrated. Um, the normal procedure, if there's not enough papers, is to photocopy or print some more. Um, it's usually available as a PDF. Uh, coming out with 22 USB sticks at very short notice. This is only noted at five minutes to the hour when the exam was beginning. And uh, we did have a very messy fallback to paper situation. Now, we've always said on our instruction card that no student will be disadvantaged because of equipment malfunctions. Um, and generally speaking, we've interpreted that by saying, if you have a, a malfunction of the computer equipment, yours or the university's, um, then if there's a multimedia question, it won't be included in the answer. So in this particular situation, we had two fully multimedia questions and, and two partially uh, multimedia, and they were referring to a PDF document. Um, the students in this group that was affected by the lack of USBs were able to do three quarters of the questions on the paper and we then got um, some knockback from the students who had brought their computers and uh, were able to do the full exam using their computer, um, that they'd had to do more questions. So we're thinking that what we're going to have to do is to make sure that a graceful fallback to paper is, is possible. And we're thinking that we may, may have to 
put some alternative questions on the paper, and I know this is going to cause even more problems, but they're only to be used if for some reason the multimedia ones are not accessible. So um, that, that's caused quite consternation here. And you can see in terms of the outcomes, um, 130 scripts, well, e-scripts are marked, 22 paper scripts, and four which were a bit mixed. Um, so we are having to make sure that we're more resilient than we have been in the past. Uh, I see that there's a little question uh, about high percentage of ownership. Over the years, we started off with institutional equipment um, in labs. We've then moved into, uh, as you can see, the, the exam room. We've allowed students to bring their own. We've, we've had some spares. Um, for the last two years, um, we've actually not provided any spares at all. Um, and that's been quite a significant change for us uh, to actually demand and expect students to bring their own laptop. But as I said at the outset, much of our learning is done online and very many students are able to bring their own laptop, or if not their own laptop, to borrow one for a friend, from a friend for the hour or two of the exam. So that's the way to go. Um, Let's look at a parallel track, because doing this at university um, needs to be matched by what's going on in schools. Um, NAFLAN, which is our national testing for literacy and numeracy in Australia, is beginning to move towards an online test environment. And um, we've been working with our Tasmanian Qualifications Authority um, to, to see what they would like to do as well. Um, They've actually been very keen and they've used the e-exam system uh, twice. Um, and in the third year, that's last year, 2013, at the end of the year, they decided to go one more. They actually ran a fully internet accessible exam and they used self-reporting of internet interactions, which students had to submit alongside uh, their answer paper, which was submitted on USB sticks, although those students didn't boot from an e-exam system such as the one that we've provided with them, they just used the ordinary operating system with the internet fully available. Um, they were able to do their exam on a computer um, and they were trusted. Um, I personally don't agree with that, but <laughs> that's, that's interesting to note that that's the pathway that our pre-university sector, our pre-tertiary sector or university entrance has gone. So 20% of some of the marks of those students have come through that route. I'll also note, because uh, there was a question on the discussion board, the different approaches to equity. That is, for the Tasmanian Qualifications Authority, it was equitable providing every student used a computer for that particular exam. Whereas in the university, our interpretation of equity has been it's equitable so long as each student can choose, in the paper replacement context, the tool to write with that suits them best. So that's been quite interesting. Um, and I see Alexander's talking about the exam for the con conditions for the students have to be equal. Um, and that's equal opportunity or equal conditions. So I'm just saying that within Tasmania, we have had a situation in the state where there have been two operational definitions of equity in that sense. So I'm just giving a short summary of where we've come from. So in 2007, when we first started doing this, it was 120 candidates, paper replacement, and they worked in labs, as I mentioned. The topic was educational computing, and it was in the Launceston campus. So last year, I stopped counting after we got to 1,000 candidates, both in the university and the pre-tertiary sector. We now have both paper replacement and post-paper for multimedia exams. Um, we've gone from institutional equipment to personally owned computers, mostly on the rationale that it's very difficult for an institution to sequester enough computers to have them available just for exams. We've also taken in a, a much broader um, set of subject areas and we've moved from a single campus, as I've shown before, to state-wide, interstate and overseas. Just looking at the 
question boards, the Australian Higher Education Act, can students opt out of this type of exam? In answer to that one, Annabelle, we actually specify the requirements for both learning and assessment as part of our unit outline. That is, the requirement to have a computer to learn is made explicit, and we actually specify the bandwidth that students need to have available, and we also specify the lowest level of equipment they will require for the exam. And I suppose one could once again reflect it back. Do we specify the writing implement that they must bring to the exam in a pen and paper? Um, Rebecca's asking about mathematics. Um, haven't got to mathematics yet, but um, I do know that computer algebra systems are used in Victoria, which is one of our neighboring states, and, and that um, is something else that we would like to work our way towards. And I think if you attend the um, talk by um, the Finnish people, which is later on in this sequence, um, they will address that item as well. Okay, moving on. What we'd like to do is to actually set questions like this, where we can give some rich multimedia content, ask students to use a piece of sophisticated software to do something really quite complicated, and when they submit their answer, it won't be a Word file, um, or it may comprise a Word file, but it may comprise um, a file produced by that design software. So we would like to be able to do um, something much more sophisticated. So Shermaine's just popped in and talking about a trial of mathematical methods, um, and we're very, very keen on that. Just as a side issue, some of you who have read my stuff will know that we're conducting some um, trials with um, final year primary school students to um, use Maple software to learn integral calculus. And uh, I visited a school doing this project last week, and uh, they're really excited. And uh, they're actually going to run the program a second time because some of the parents whose children didn't get into that particular activity have written strong letters of objection to the school and saying we want our children included. So once we feel that these exciting things can happen, it might actually work on curriculum transformation. I do want to deal with some serious technical challenges. Uh, the first one is a virtual machine challenge. What do you do if the person starts up the USB on a virtual machine that keeps their real operating system or their home operating system alive underneath and they can dodge in and out and perhaps get internet access or get to some facts and figures you didn't want them to be able to have. Um, one of the things, of course, is to make sure that the machines are switched off when they come in. You know, show me your machine, show me that there's no power lights. That might be one way of getting around it. We've also been able to identify some standard ports, which allows us to identify virtual machine operation from within the e-exam. So we're hoping to defeat that problem. Ports in the underlying operating system. Well, we do know that um, Microsoft issues patches several hundred in a two or three year period. And that's something we can't run away from. Finally, I've become aware of USB keyboard injector hacks. You can go to a standard shop for hackers, and you can buy a little device which apparently could be fitted inside a laptop, which may, after, say, 10 minutes of operation, pretend to be an external keyboard. And providing you've got a, a notepad or something like that, document open, send a load of text, you know, several megabytes of text into that document. So that, that is a hack that will be very difficult to defeat. Um, I'm just making sure I check the reading as well. Schools practice the, the software they're going to use in the exam, yes, of course. Exactly. Let's talk about institutional innovation resistance, and I'm sure you will all be used to this. Um, I've talked about the fact that we had not enough USBs issued for a post paper exam, and what I intend to do about that. The chat board has brought up the issue of typing versus writing speeds, and I believe I've addressed that. Technical support resourcing. I'd like to divide this into two elements. First of all, the setting up of the room is similar to setting up all the desks and carpets and so on. So that's a first point. In the most recent exam I attended, we had two technical support officers for nearly 70 students. One of them answered his email all the way through 
the exam was not required at all. Um, and Matthew Hillier has to be thanked for this, that he's achieved a degree of technical resilience, which meant for those who did have a USB and booted from it, either on a Mac or a PC, it's working extremely well. Um, those students had autosave set on their machines so that every two minutes, about the time it takes to go to a loo, um, they were able to save, or, or their, soft, their material was automatically saved onto the answers partition. Um, I'm going to go to Alexander's question. How much time does the prepping of the laptops in the, the room take? Uh, make sure that no virtual machine is running and so on. What's the maximum number of students? How does this approach scale? So the biggest um, single venue we've had doing an exam, Alexander, is about 120 students. Um, we coped with that very well, and I'm sure we could have taken more on. Um, we don't, at the moment, do a visual check about virtual machines, um, but we're aware that that is a challenge, a technical challenge that we will need to be aware of, um, and we may need to either counter it internally to the USB or by getting um, the invigilators to do that check. Um, so we don't otherwise check, prepare the laptops in any way. Uh, because we were relying upon that security image to show them, show us that they've booted up from the, the correct thing. Occupational health and safety concerns. People have said, look, uh, people are bending their necks down. Um, this is occupational health and safety. Of course, if they were using pen on paper, they'd be bending the neck down as well, um, and that's another issue. So we haven't directly answered it. We've just compared it with the exam situation prior to the computer. And we've also dealt with the cheating by reading another candidate's screen on the way through. So our institution is battling with this. We did have it approved by Senate. Um, our University Teaching and Learning Committee is wanting to re-examine the issues. And uh, the, the lack of USBs has forced us now to accept that we may, may for, we may need for the next three or four years to allow a graceful fallback onto paper. That's what I wanted to say. So I've now got to the point where we can spend some time in question and answer. Um, I'll put it over to you, Matthew, to chair the question and answer session. OK, we have one question from Annabelle. Would you like to press the talk button to speak into your microphone, please? Is that the talk button? Yep, it Hello. is. Carry on. Oh, I'm just very interested in this issue of um, being able to require students to have laptops, because I'm quite interested in mobile devices, but my understanding from an Australian university is that we can't require students to have anything for assessments. We can't require them to actually buy anything, unless I think there's sometimes there's some particular trade-off, like if you buy uh, a, an iPad, you will save this much on your textbooks. So was there some sort of process that you had to go through to have that approved? Um, the normal process for having our unit outline approved was the process that we already gone through. And about for our university, um, the way we interpret that is that we're not allowed to specify a specific piece of equipment that the student must have from a particular source. So for instance, we may specify a textbook in our unit outline, but we're not allowed to say you must buy it from this retailer or this other source. Uh, and the same thing would apply for the laptops that they use for either their study purposes or for their assessment. We can specify, uh, and I think we specify one gigabyte of RAM um, and a certain screen size, um, about a 10 inch screen as being the minimum. But we can't specify what make or model, and we can't specify okay. from where they are to obtain that piece of equipment. That's interesting because when, um, in, I mean, in the universities that I've worked in in Victoria, when we specify a textbook, we have to offer that textbook um, through the library, and it has to be free to students. So, uh, and I think we have interpreters uh, in, in, you know, in not just in one, but in the the ones that I have been in, um, that the same does apply to equipment. You, you just simply can't ask students to buy anything in order to complete their assessment, and it's it's only for assessment um, as far as as I've seen, although. Um, in terms of equity, the different institutions have applied that in different ways. But um, 
we've always sort of aimed to have everything that students must do on a computer, they must be able to do on a computer in the library that's been made available freely. Yeah, um, but what would you do about specifying a writing implement for a pen on paper exam? Well, that would be something you could provide very cheaply, in fact. Um, and often the paper itself is provided free. So yeah, yeah, yeah. this is quite a different scale. It, it is, um, but it's also something which certainly our students are expected to have access to for their learning. And, and yes, you're right. In many cases, they can go to a lab or they can go to the library to, to borrow a book. But um, in most cases, they prefer to have their own particular equipment. And uh, yeah, that's that's the interpretation we've had here. Anyway, as I said, the formal process is through the approval of our unit outline, and that gives us the, the capacity I, yeah, to, to warn them beforehand. It's something that I couldn't recommend in our institution because they wouldn't allow it. Um, they wouldn't. It, it wouldn't be allowed that students would have to own their own hardware and software. Yeah, um, yeah. So anyway, that's just just my observation from another right. perspective. Thank you very much, Annabelle. I'm just uh, can I chip in on that one? Um, yep. um, I think we've also got similar problems over here, <coughs> although we haven't faced it as such yet. Um, but in terms of equity access, um, perhaps you need to. What you need to do is you have a, a pool of laptops that can be borrowed or loaned, just like you have a pool of textbooks. So, whilst you can't force the students to buy the textbooks, you stick ten in the library, and you stick them on two-hour loan. Students soon realise it's probably so much less troublesome just to buy a textbook or photocopy their friends or something. You know, students don't. You don't the university doesn't have to provide a hundred textbooks in the library for each hundred students in a course. So I think there's kind of a you end up playing a numbers game with how many you think you can get away with. And I think equity programs and loan equipment is probably the way around this problem, um, where you'd expect yes. that the vast majority of students would provide their own because they've got it anyway. I suppose that's my question is, what is the equity provision that's provided for this circumstance? Uh, well, I can certainly answer that in terms of our local situation. That um, Here in Launceston, where I'm based, um, for the last two or three years, we've had no problems whatsoever expecting and requiring students to bring their own laptops. And, and that's become a tradition, if you like, a local cultural thing. The same exam has been done in Hobart and uh, in Burnie, cities two or three hours journey away. Um, and the culture there isn't quite the same thing. It's taking longer for those two other cities, even though one of them is the capital city for our state, um, for that same culture of bringing your own equipment. So for instance, I know that we do what Matthew does. Well, rather than providing uh, laptops to Bernie, we allow an overflow of students into the computer lab in the room next door to where the exam is being held. Mm -hmm. So I think yep. Matthew's pointing in the right direction. Okay, that's good. I mean, that's good to yeah, know. That we, we have sorry, a lot of issues. <laughs> we simply couldn't provide, and we really, you know, we would need to have um, an alternative like the overflow room. Sure. Yeah. All right. Thank, thank you. you. A trolley of laptops is a good idea. You just roll them into the room, and if people happen to not have a laptop, you can either get them to put their name down for one in advance or loan it out on the spot, which has already been pre-configured to the system. Yeah. Which question next, Matthew? Uh, let me see. Ken's got his hand up. <laughs> Let's go for Ken. <laughs> Ken, can you press the talk button and speak to us, or are you writing? Oh, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Very well. Thank you. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Um, uh, with. Um, Oh, do you do you think it's, it's at all practical to uh, to in fact put the um, laptop users in a separate room for management purposes? Oh, in that particular situation, we only have about twenty students, so it's actually quite easy for for the supervisor to supervise them. Um, I, I am anxious. Uh, you'll see from the videos that we've been working towards and have achieved a situation where the laptop users and the pen users can be in the same mass um, exam hall situation. And I think that's probably the right way to go. Um, and I would see is, you know, what I'm hoping to do is to ask our exams office to dedicate um, one 
column of disks or maybe two columns of disks each year to e-exams. Um, certainly in the paper replacement sort of situation, um, and this is one of those things we're going to have to talk through. If you tell 100 students that they can choose to use the laptop, uh, but there's only 45 places, what do you do with the 46th person who comes in with a laptop? So those sorts of situations we haven't grappled with yet. Yes, I'm, I'm sure that there's a lot of these little itchy you know, logistics types of things that, that will keep popping up for some, for some time and until it becomes uh, you know, more de rigueur. I agree, I agree. Yeah, thank you very much, Tim. Okay, um, okay, I think I've got this comment from Rebecca. What do you do if the laptop fails during the exam? I'll tell you what we do, Rebecca. Um, obviously, the student will put their hand up to request intervention by the supervisor, and the supervisors remain in charge of the situation. The technical support person won't move until they're required to do so by the supervisor. Um, usually, the supervisor will say, this is technical, I can't handle this, and they call in uh, an IT officer. Um, the IT officer will generally speaking say to the student, do you want to reboot if it's you know, a crash situation? And if the student is happy to reboot, the saved exam will pop up and providing they're happy to continue, they can continue straight back on again. Um, the second sort of alternative to offer them is if they're not happy to reboot on their own laptop because they've lost confidence in their own personal laptop. Um, to offer them a loan laptop, and you know we're, we're beginning to try to reduce that option. But as Matthew said, it makes sense to have that available. And the third option is to have the graceful fall back to paper. Paper hasn't gone away, um, but I've pointed out some of the difficulties that we're beginning to grapple with um, for multimedia exams. Where yes, we are going to have to, for some time, provide a graceful paper fallback. And I think Tim Hunt first a question. You know, how long will you keep on having a graceful fallback to paper? I don't know. I'd like to say that we won't need it because computers will be so reliable in five years' time that it will be considered preposterous. But um, it's a watch this space thing. I wish I had Tim got statistics on these things. Um, I do know that I had a couple of USB sticks returned to me last time with the message, these are faulty. When I tried them on my own equipment, they worked fine. Um, how many times are reboots needed? I'd say one per 100. And that's an interesting figure, because I know that the Tasmanian Qualifications Authority regard their paper exams to have a reliability which exceeds one per 1,000 problems. So we do actually have quite a long way to go before we can claim that our computer-based systems are as reliable, if you like, as paper-based systems. So that's quite good. Charmaine has asked a question about what technical expertise is required to write exams in the Ubuntu software. And that's a good one. We've tailored the system to the University of Tasmania and said to assessors, lecturers writing exam papers, that they should have to do very little indeed to change their processes. So what happens is that our lecturers, as a matter of course for all exams, papers and paper ones included, submit their exam paper as a word processor document to a secure server. For an e-exam, we extract that word document and we put it onto the USB with some minor formatting changes. Um, that's not something that the lecturers have to learn. We do it for them. So technical expertise required, none. Alexander says, did you experience USB drives going defective during the exam, and how do you deal legally with this? No, as I said, we've had USB drives that have been claimed to have malfunctioned, but in fact, it wasn't a malfunction of the USB at all. I will speak briefly about this. Uh, I've had hysterics myself when I put what I call a long USB into, um, well, I've seen students use a long USB. And in an open book exam, they've been wanging bits of paper around the exam desk. And I felt very nervous that the USB might be hit. And of course, if you take out the USB from the machine, it's a bit like taking the hard drive out um, halfway through some sort of operation. Not good. Um, and I'm now moving to some very, very short USBs where there's a full length metal USB s s plug that goes into the computer. 
and what sticks out of the, the um, laptop is only about five mils thick just to make sure it's very, very difficult indeed to dislodge that USB. So we don't have problems of that kind of defection. Um, using simula we're going to have to stop soon, Matthew, but I'm happy to carry on. Using simulations and papers. So if there's no change in the paper setting process, how do paper setters do it now? So I think I've covered that, Rebecca. I'm not sure. Come back to me if I haven't. And Shaming asks, are the papers marked online? Do assessors enter their scores online? I think I've also covered that by saying we do not prescribe any particular method of marking, although I will say that the Tasmanian Qualifications Authority embraced e-exams because they reticulate things electronically amongst their markers over quite a distance. Okay, Matthew, back to you. Okay, thanks, Andrew. Um, we are now at 6 p.m. Eastern Australian Standard Time, so that's about us, and um, we must be uh, getting on in the morning in Europe. So if you could kindly click the blue link on the screen, um, that will take you to the um, feedback survey. We would love to have your feedback on the session. Uh, feel free to get in contact with either Andrew or myself. Um, we will follow up on any further questions you might have. Um, as I mentioned before, this session is being recorded. It will be posted online in due course, although it may take a couple of weeks given we've got a whole lot of sessions coming up. So the next session for Transforming Assessment will be on Wednesday. So the e-assessment conference continues on Wednesday. So thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.